what's with the cupcake? And you're a king among men. Thanks for the time. We're taking it back to about the late 80s with the boys from Ford Chip Ganassi Racing. What are you What are you using there? Just a little bit of old school glass cleaner? And Augie, I got like that much. Will, will that get me in the car next season? Not a chance. Thanks for coming in today. Thank you. Dominic Selzy in the Roth Motorsports number 83. Dominic, good talking to you. Thanks, guys. Zeb Wise from Angola, Indiana, joining me on the first ever TLP Talks. We don't know if this is going to fail or fly or, or whatever, so it kind of all hinges on your okay. answers and your Thank performance. You. Yes, I'm glad that all the pressure's on me. I appreciate that. We are here today getting ready to go uh, racing. Wrapped up last night at 34. Uh, today, Tri-City Speedway. The backdrop is the playground. And Justin Peck. Justin Peck. <laughs> getting, a, getting a little bit of pre-race pump in. Yep. Um, kids, families, the drivers, their kids are, are here hanging out. It's a beautiful day. What are your early memories of, 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 do you have early memories like this? Going to a racetrack, hanging out, um, just being a kid at the track. What did you start in, quarter midgets? Yeah, I started in quarter midgets and so, you know, a lot of my time, like I guess being a kid at the track was at the quarter midget track and, you know, we used to have, uh, we had these big wheels. I forget what they were called. Um, so, I mean, we would, we would get done racing uh, and you know it would go dark or whatever the lights are still on at the quarter midget track and we would all get our big wheels together and go have another race um, and run our own race around you know light poles or you know whatever the case was so um, yeah that was a you know a lot of my time as a kid was quarter midget racing so I didn't really get to come to sprint car races or whatever because I was racing myself um, Eldora Speedway was always one that I got to go to because we raced quarter midget just at the Little E so um, I don't remember exactly which weekend it was, but I would come over and get to watch. I think it was Four Crown. It had to have been because I would get to watch, you know, Brian Clawson and and Kyle Arson when you know he was dominating the USAC stuff and, and whatever it was. So um, yeah, it was just uh, yeah, it was a fun time. I I grew up all around racing, so it was, it was pretty cool. Brian Clawson is a name that comes up a lot. So you talked about going to Eldora, racing quarter midgets at Little E as a kid. Tell me about your first memories uh, of Brian, and then maybe. You know how that progressed into a relationship with him um yeah as a kid he was always always the guy i watched just because you know everyone kind of always talked about how good he was off the racetrack and that was kind of the biggest thing was how cool he was you know out of the race car so um yeah watching him at eldora and we all know how good he was there uh in non-wing sprint cars and midgets and you know really anything he got in so um yeah there was racing i was racing quarter midgets uh at ims actually at the it was called the little brickyard or something like that i don't remember what the exact name is and um brian had act brian and tim were actually there to watch a different driver uh to go into the next you know brian had his development program and uh they were there to watch someone else and they were you know basically recruiting um and i you know i've, I've been told this since then i didn't know it at the time but you know brian kind of watched me and uh, I must have caught his eye in some way, I guess, and just kind of basically was like, I want to go talk to those guys. Like they, you know, that kid seems to have it figured out or whatever the case would have been. So we, uh, we talked to Brian and Tim, and then um, I had actually I grew up, kind of started racing micros and talked to Tim and Brian about, you know, coming out to Indiana Sprint Week and basically just being a crew guide, see what the road's like, come out and, and do it the hard way, right? Learn what working on the race car was like instead of just driving it all the time. So I went out and spent, I don't know, it was like three or four nights on the road with them during Indiana Sprint Week and uh, capped it off with watching Brian win his US, last USAC non-wing win. So wow. it, was, uh, it was at Lawrenceburg, it was really cool. Sunshine ran second that night. He got schooled on a restart by Brian, so that made it exciting. Um, but. Yeah, so I got, long story short, after the races, uh, Brian pulled Tim aside and said, you know, that's the kid we need in our development program, talking about me. And um, obviously, you know, went down the road, Brian ended up passing away, and then Clawson Marshall Racing got started. And uh, yeah, that's that's how I kind of got my name out here, I guess, is I, I owe it all to Brian and Tim Clawson, really. I mean, um, Brian's the reason. I think if it wasn't for Brian, I my career, I don't know where it would be. Yeah. You know, he's the one who kind of put me on the map, basically. You just said it. You have no idea where your career would be if it weren't for Brian Clawson. So when Brian has his accident, you know, what do you, you know, what what happens to you? What what does Zeb Wise go through in that time? 
obviously I don't suggest that you're comparing it, your your tragedy to his tragedy or yeah. his family's tragedy, obviously yeah, yeah. very different things, but you lost a friend. Yeah. You lost someone that was very, very important to your career. You know, can you tell me anything? Are you willing to talk at all about what it was like those those days after he passed? Yeah, I, I think I had actually, uh, I just raced a micro that night somewhere in Oklahoma and we were going on the road and yeah, I just saw it on Twitter that obviously he was in a bad crash. And um, yeah, I mean, to be completely honest, I knew Brian and was, you know, around him a decent amount, but I didn't really know him like personally and mm -hmm. wasn't like super close with him. Um, it didn't, you know, it was a horrible day for really motorsports in general. Um, but, and at the time, I didn't know that Brian said those things about me. And I didn't know that I was, you know, even in the realm of being the next development driver for him. So yeah, I, it was, it sucked. I mean, that was someone that I looked up to and, you know, kind of like, I had hoped that I was gonna be kind of under his wing and be, you know, he was gonna be my mentor. Um, and, you know, after, after the passing and everything, and uh, when Klaus and Marshall got started and I got into the seat of the 39 car, uh, Sunshine really turned into my mentor that I was, you know, hoping to get with Brian. So, um, yeah, Tyler's kind of always been the one that almost like filled that gap for me and always like, you know, was there. I remember, for instance, here at Tri-City, uh, I was racing a midget and he was also, he was racing a midget, my teammate, and we sat up there in the stands and uh, just him coaching me along, basically telling, you know, you should do this here, this here. And, um, you know, he's great with the fans off the track too. He obviously, his mentor was Brian. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he definitely filled that gap. But uh, yeah, that was a that was a tough time for motorsports when Brian passed for sure. Yeah, right there, Tyler Courtney. You, you, you hit the nail on the head with everybody I talked to in the last couple of days when I said, hey, I'm, I'm gonna sit down and do a, a talk with Zeb. Where, where's my gold mine of information? And everybody says, well, everybody says two things about you. They say, video gamer, which, you know, that's not really the answer to the question no. I was asking, but, they, but then they say, go talk to Tyler Courtney. Yeah. And you and Tyler do have a great relationship and I, you just put it in a really interesting, you know, the words you used, I thought were really interesting. Brian was to Tyler, what Tyler ended up being to you. Absolutely, yeah. Is that fair to say? No, 100%. Um, that's exactly right. I mean, that's the exact way I look at it too. And yeah, Tyler's been, like I said earlier, he, he filled that gap for me that I was hoping I would get with Brian. Um, you know, there was, there was a lot of looking up to Brian for me. And when he passed, Tyler was that person that I looked up to and watched and still to this day, um, you know, he's had a great season and I look up to him like, you know, wish that was me. Like, yeah. I wanna, I wanna be like that someday. Yeah. And um, I'm still young. I'm a lot younger than Tyler, and that wasn't an old joke. But <laughs> um, yeah, still a lot younger than him, and uh, have a long ways to go. But yeah, Tyler. I mean, we do a lot of things together. Whether that's you know, play video games or uh, go golf together, or, you know, whatever the case may be. And both our girlfriends are buddies, or mm -hmm. girlfriends, or whatever you want to call them. So. Um, yeah, they're, the girls are buddies. The girls are buddies, whatever you want to say. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, we've grown really close. Honestly, we were, we were, we were teammates at Klaus and Marshall for three years. And then uh, we kind of, you know, I went my separate way, went to the wing deal. And then I was there for, probably, I don't know, maybe a year or two. And then he ended up coming down, him and Klaus and Marshall Racing went down the wing deal as well, or wing path. And, uh, they came on and like dominated what I was doing. And I'm like, man, I've been doing this for two years and you guys just come in here and start dominating right. immediately. And then, uh, you know, fast forward a year or so and I get hooked up with Redeen Racing and then, um, man, what an awesome battle all year with him for the All-Star Championship. And there is not another person I would have wanted to battle that hard with that close for an All-Star Championship. I mean, like getting to race that, that much with your best friend, like, I mean, it was it was a blast, and uh, you know we have a lot of respect for each other on and off the racetrack, and um, yeah, it's just uh, it's fun going up and down the road racing, you know, hard with uh, some of your best friends. All of your really big wins, the World of Outlaws victory, your first Outlaw victory at Port Royal last year. Yep. Your BC thirty nine win, right? Yep. Um, I'm blanking on the other two. Uh, the all did you say the All Star one at Eldora? The the wing, yeah, the wing win. Yep. For four crown. Yep. At Eldora. B 
BC39, then you had Port Royal with the Outlaws. Yeah, those are three. And uh, he, there's one more. He named I'm a missing. fourth one. I didn't want to Oh, uh, Kokomo uh, Rudine Race. Kokomo Race yeah. Rudine Foundation Race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those four individual races. And then last year, folks who know how the All-Star Championship finished out know the stat I'm getting to here. He finished second to you in the All-Star Championship. Yeah. And he's ran second to you in those four major wins. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, that's nuts. Yeah, I didn't even think about it until I was driving down the road one night. You know, late night, you start thinking about weird stuff when you're driving. And uh, yeah, like it was just weird. I was like going through all of my big wins and was like, man, Tyler's ran second in all of those. Like yeah. pretty wild to think about for sure. Do you guys like, he, he joked about it. He said that he, uh, he didn't really notice it and it was you that thought about it. And I kind of thought, well, God, as the guy who ran second, they would eat me up more to be the one who always ran second, but it sounds like it was you who, who kind of dug up that staff. Yeah, yeah, it was me. I mean, I'm the one who kind of came up with it and, <laughs> hi Parker. Parker Price Miller bringing his t-shirt trailer in here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was the one who thought about it, which I'm sure he didn't really care to hear that yeah. stat, but I, I couldn't wait to tell him. I mean, obviously we have a, like we're very competitive obviously with each other. And I think we race each other harder than we do anyone else just naturally around each other so much, I feel like. so. Um, yeah, it's just, it was just a funny stat that I thought about like six in the morning driving down the road and I called him immediately and was like, Hey, you want to hear this? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he was, uh, he wasn't too thrilled to hear about it. I also, I also passed him. He hates this race, but I also passed him on like with two to go in a midget race at Linda's and he ran second in that one. So, um, I like to bring that one up all the time because, uh, he was pretty frustrated then. You told Wing Nation in an interview I watched with you recently, the, the interview was a couple months ago, but I just watched the interview, getting ready for the high limit season. And you, you, you know, you kind of precursored or, you know, you got out ahead of your answer by saying, I know this sounds really cocky, but you talked about, you know, when you first got into wing racing, you sort of had this feeling that you could be really good at this and you guys weren't really good right out of the gate. And yeah. I, I'm guessing that was your McGee days. Yeah, yeah. So what I want to know is, and of course, you know, this isn't at all about placing blame on why you weren't fast or why you struggled, but where does that feeling of, you didn't really have any wing experience, but yet you told Wing Nation, I just felt like I could be really, really good if things all lined up and worked out the right way. Where does that, like, where does that confidence come from? Because um, driving a wing yeah. 410, I don't think should come off easy to anybody. Yeah, no, it, it definitely, I mean, it doesn't to this day for me. I mean, I've been doing it for, four or five years now and it still is far from easy um it's just I don't know if it was I was just really confident like in my abilities I guess and I feel like with this deal or you know any honestly anything in this world like you have to be so confident in yourself to be able to succeed in a lot of this and um in the past I've been probably not as confident as I should have been like just kind of put myself down almost before anything even happens and um I kind of went in the wing deal like man, if I could just have everything line up together, like, you know, right team, right people in place, uh, that I think I could do this pretty successfully. And um, I feel like I've, I'm, I've gotten to that point. I've, I've got a great team. I uh, love my car owners and love the three guys I have back in the pit area. And um, I'm confident in myself. And, you know, I, there's no reason why we can't go, you know, win one of these championships. I just have to get more experience and, um, you know, Unfortunately, I'm probably not naturally talented like Corey Day, so I have to work for it a little harder than he does. But um, yeah, just keep our heads down, keep digging. You're gonna have bad nights as part of this deal, unfortunately. Uh, no one's uh, perfect at anything night in and night out, so you're gonna have the bad nights and you gotta move on and, and keep going. Speaking of your car owners, Blake Anderson, who's now a integral part yeah. of the Rudine family, the Rudine corporations, yeah. everything Kevin does. He told me a little bit about Kevin and your relationship. And one thing he said to me, well, you know, he said a lot to me about Kevin, all obviously very good. One, one thing I'll just, I'll out myself here. I don't know Kevin very well. And in my, in my very brief dealings with Kevin, um, he comes off like a very intimidating guy, but Blake, you know, immediately squashed that and said, he, you know, that perception, it, it, you know, is, is pretty far from the truth. Kevin's a very caring dude. He's very patient, which I thought was one thing interesting that I thought Blake chose to say about him. And he said, you know, as far as a car owner, Kevin looks at it as he's got drivers and he's got crew members and Kevin's job, he looks at it as, according to Blake, is 
his job is to supply you guys with what you need. Is that how you feel when you show up to work underneath underneath Kevin Redeem that you have the tools that you need to do your job and if you don't have them currently, you, you'll have access to them shortly? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Kevin Kevin doesn't short us on anything as far as you know the tools we need to succeed. That is, there's no doubt about it. Um, Kevin is probably the, like if you had to think of a car owner that you would want, Kevin's at the top of the list okay. for me. Yeah. Um, like he's, he gives us everything we need to succeed, never, never asks us questions, never puts a lot of pressure on us. That's something else Blake said, exactly just, what you just said. He doesn't put yeah. pressure on his guys. He just wants us to, you know, go have fun, go win some races, yeah. go, you know, be consistent, be competitive, be in the hunt. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I want to see my race car up front. Yeah. Like it's just, but he doesn't, like he's not calling us and like, hey, what happened last yeah. night? Or, you know, we need to work on this. Or, like obviously, the, you know, there's gonna be times where those conversations need to be had if we're going down a, you know, the wrong path. But um, yeah, there's zero pressure felt from us as far as a race team from him. And, you know, as a driver and, you know, a crew chief and a car guy or a tire guy and a car guy, like that goes a long ways to not feel a lot of pressure from upper management. Like, you know, if if he was calling every day and, you know, we need to run top five tomorrow night or, um, you know, we need to be better at this and this and, you know, that starts wearing on you pretty quick, especially when you're, you know, driving up and down the road every day. And you, when you're driving up and down the road, you got a lot of thoughts that go through your yeah. mind. So, you know, things like that can wear on you. But yeah, Kevin's just a, he's, he's the best car owner I could ask for, for sure. Blake Anderson compared Kevin Redeen to another car owner in the sport of sprint car racing and, and, and another boss of Blake Anderson's. Tony Stewart. Yeah. And he said he's Kevin's very much like Stewart in the sense that he has a huge heart and he just wants to supply his people with what they need to do their job. Yeah. And that I like I obviously I've never worked for Tony or raced for Tony, but as an outsider looking in, the way Tony runs his operation is he gives everything or he gives his team the tools they need to succeed and steps back and lets them, yeah. you know, try to do their job. And Kevin's very, very similar to that. So, so yeah. So I do want to ask this question, and we'll, we will get away from like all the heavy racing stuff. But okay, Rudine Racing, you you come into that job halfway through, or a little bit past, I guess, halfway through 2022. Corey Elison was in that car, I think, for three years. And you can you can you know choose to pass on this question or or or, or answer it at whatever length you want. But I I find it very interesting in this world of sprint car racing where there's young guys like yourself, like Corey Elison who are making their living driving these race cars, and you guys pour your lives into every single night out on these tracks, and then sometimes, you know, things change. You, you can be dropped. A driver can choose to walk away from an operation. How does that go down in the pit area between you and Corey? I mean, you know, we'll just, we'll just, we'll just say it, between you and Corey, what were those days like when, when Corey leaves the 26 and you come into it, is that, awkward is that tense do you and do, do you and the other driver do the drivers have those conversations what is that dynamic like when that happens in the middle of a season or out of a season for that matter yeah so it's definitely not ideal right yeah. like because i had known Corey for a little while actually before that whole deal because Corey's actually the one who like he was at my first uh micro sprint test ever like so that was that goes back a long time. Yeah. I was I think probably eleven or twelve years old. So I've known Corey Lyson for a long time, and um, yeah. So obviously all that stuff happened, and it is awkward. Yeah. Like because I had a you know relationship with Corey. Not that we were you know best buddies, but um, it does make it a little like tense or awkward when you're around him. And you know I had actually sent him a text or called him or something. I don't really remember. It was around the time like hey like want you to know like I don't I don't have anything against you and I sure hope you don't have anything against me like yeah. you know I I took an opportunity that was in front of me um and I think that's the I mean I feel like drivers you got to do what you got to do and you know if I got fired tomorrow and they put someone else in the race car um I don't have the right to be mad at that guy he just took an opportunity that he thought was right for him like mm -hmm. I mean there's really I feel like you know, me and Corey are great now. Corey yeah. actually comes under the trailer and we, we talk a lot. So, yeah, um, yeah it's just, it, it is awkward at first, but, you know, we're professionals and we have to get over it. And, you know, we're on the racetrack every night together. So yeah. you got to sort it out.